Well, if you've been with us for a little bit of time, you realize that we have been journeying through the book of Ephesians as uh, we work our way through that. And it's a book that reminds us of what life in Christ looks like. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And it is one of the things that we are concerned about is, is to develop, we could use the term discipleship pathway, that when a person comes to faith in Christ, that is not the end of the story. That's merely the beginning. Um, use the analogy that when you stand up front and you say your I do's when you get married, uh, that isn't the final aspect of your life. That's just the new beginning. And so when you come to know Jesus, it's the beginning of a new way and a new walk. And there are new things that begin to occur. It, It is being born again. It's a new life that we find in Christ. So what does that look like? And so that's what the book of Ephesians and obviously other books that are corollary to this particular one teach us. It reminds us of what God has done for us in the person of Jesus Christ and how we are to live in light of what God has done for us, the reality of a changed and a transformed life. That the work of salvation, that that mystery that uh, we've seen and that the angels don't understand because they haven't experienced it and they can't experience, that you and I experience in our lives a mystery of a transformed life, of of what it means to be B.C., before Christ, before knowing Jesus, and what it means to know him and to live for him. We've completed the first three chapters, and we move into the fourth chapter this morning. And as we mentioned to you previously, Paul, as he often does, divides uh, this particular letter, this particular epistle, into two parts. The first three chapters are doctrinal. These are truths, and I don't Doctrine isn't supposed to scare us. It's a good word. It's truth. What is truth? What is doctrine? And so we are given the foundation of what we are to believe, of what has occurred within our lives when we trusted Christ, what what he did for us. And then in chapter 4 on through chapter 6, it's how do we live in light of that? How do we live in light of the fact of what Jesus has done for us? Some people have, you know, it's the identity in Christ in chapters 1 through 3. In chapters 4 through 6, it's, it's our behavior in Christ. Chapters 1 through 3 provide for us the motivation for how we are to live and how we are to conduct ourselves as we see in chapters 4 through 6. And so the unseen work of God in chapters 1 through 3 become visible in chapters 4 through 6 as God works through us. And so we're... It's not that doctrine is impractical. We need it in order to know how to live. It's very practical. So Ephesians 4, through chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, the main emphasis of the section we're going to look at today is how do we maintain unity within the church of Jesus Christ? And what does that look like within the church of Jesus Christ? We're given the foundation for this unity, and it's based on certain truths This isn't a unity of, oh, they're they're some sort of a church or they have some claim to be uh, religious and so we're going to have unity with them. Unity is based on a common belief and a common understanding of who Jesus is that, that we get from the Bible. There are certain religious groups that we will not have unity with. In fact, even though we read about the love that ought to be in us, doctrine divides, dear friends. The doctrine of salvation divides between those who are in and those who are out, those who have trusted Christ and those who have not. It's not a matter of everybody goes to heaven if you just try hard or if you do religious things. There's a doctrine that divides us, and that is that the only hope that we have is found in the person of Jesus who paid our price who went to the cross and paid for us. It's called the substitutionary atonement. Big word basically means he died in our place so that whosoever puts their faith and trust in him will have eternal life that begins here and now and then goes on forever. And so unity among the followers of Jesus is a big deal. It's what Jesus prayed for in John chapter 17, which is truly the Lord's Prayer. That 2,000 years ago, approximately, Jesus, as he prayed in John 17, prayed for us that we would be unified and that the world would see him because we are unified around him. 
But just having doctrinal unity is, is not enough. It has to be maintained. And so in the section we're going to look at, we're going to see how it is to be maintained. But, but don't misunderstand, this, these doctrinal principles aren't just for the church. <laughs> they will work in your home. They will work in your marriage. They will work as you interact among people at work that they are very practical aspects to biblical truth and that the new life in Christ should transform our homes, should transform our marriages, should transform how we work. And we'll see those in the coming chapters. And Paul spends some significant amount of time about what life in the home looks like because of the transforming work of Christ. But we are not going that place today. We want to look at what does unity look like and how do we get that. And and so we're told about that. And so I invite you to grab a Bible. You turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 6. If you want to follow along in a Bible that's uh, there in a pew in front of you, it's uh, page 1171. And, And again, if you don't have a Bible, we have some we would like to make available to you. Um, uh, they're free of charge. They are, they are our textbook. And so we do encourage you to carry one because at times we'll put the, we will put the verses up on the screen, but it's hard sometimes to flip back and forth and to see some of the context. So what we find, first of all, in Ephesians chapter 4, it's really broken down into two main sections. In verses 1 through 3, there's a call to unity. And then in verses 4 through 6, what is the foundation of that unity? What is it that binds us together? What is it that holds us together? So first of all, let's look at the call for unity. We start in verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you, or you could say urge you, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And so Paul is saying, look, I'm, I'm a prisoner. We've heard that before. He's already told us that in Ephesians. And it isn't, it isn't the fact as woe is me. He's not asking for sympathy. What he's saying is I'm a follower of Christ. And as a result of that, there are certain things that have occurred in my life. You see, dear friends, this idea that if you trust Jesus, everything goes nice and smoothly is totally false. You know, if you just, just trust Christ and... You'll be healthy, and you'll be wealthy, and you'll be wise. You know, as the old song says, certainly not biblical, never promised you the rose garden, right? That's not what the walk with Christ. Oh, it's a blessed walk. Don't misunderstand me. But oftentimes, there's difficulty. And sometimes you're going to find that as you live out Christianity in your workplace for those who are antagonistic about the things of Christ. And so Paul says, sometimes walking with Christ, there's a cost. And Jesus said that if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And then Paul goes on and and his main emphasis, uh, here's what he is praying for. Here's what he is urging. I entreat you, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. The manner worthy of our calling. I urge you. Uh, This isn't a take it or leave it. It isn't like if you feel like living the Christian life, fine. If you don't, that's fine also. Paul says we're called to live a different kind of life. It's to transform us. And in fact, the word that's used here is the same one that we get the idea, the, the paraclete referring to the Holy Spirit. It means to walk alongside of. And so I, I'm, I'm encouraging you, I'm urging you He writes to us to walk. That means it's a lifelong process. It's a lifelong journey. Some of your translations read vocation. And if we understand that, you know, it's our job in a sense, but it isn't a matter. You don't get to choose this job. Once you choose Christ, you're chosen to live this life. Now, don't misunderstand. There are times which we're going to get tripped up. There are times we're going to stumble in our walk and in our journey. There are times that we are going to fall. There are times that are going to be setbacks. But the walking that's referred to here is a continued pattern of life. 
Yes, you may have tripped up. I may have tripped up, but by God's grace, there's forgiveness. Get back up. Let somebody else walk alongside of you. It's so important. And so we don't live in a state of defeat. It's like, all right, Lord, that's not how I should have responded. That's not what I should have done. But thank you for your grace and your forgiveness and continue heading in the direction in which you have chosen to walk. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. The word worthy that's used there is the idea, it, it comes from a balanced scale. If you remember some of those kinds of things where, where, where you have this uh, bar across and two containers on either side, if you went to buy uh, maybe uh, a pound of ground beef, on one side, there would be put some sort of weight, a uh, one-pound weight. And on the other side, the ground beef would be put in so that it would balance, it would equal. And that's what Paul is saying here is that, that our walk ought to be equal with our calling. If somebody is worthy of their pay, that means they put in the same kind of work as they are getting paid for, that, that they are worthy of their pay. And so God is calling us as followers of Jesus to walk in a way in which we have been called. What have we been called to? We've been called to be sons and daughters of God. There's no higher calling. And so we're called to walk in a way in which we are, live out the life, this high calling. Again, we will stumble, we will fall, but we continue the journey. And that's the way the word is often used, is used in the New Testament when it refers to our walk. It's, it's the general pattern, it's the direction of our life. And so we're to walk, we're urged to walk, we're implored to walk in a way that is characteristic of our calling. You say, well, what does that look like? Well, then Paul gives to us uh, five characteristics, and there are more in other passages, but in this particular passage, he gives to us five characteristics of what a worthy walk looks like. And you find them in, in verse 2. And so he says, I want, I, I want you to walk with humility and gentleness and patience and showing forbearance to one another and, uh, in, in love and being diligent to preserve the unity of the bond of the spirit of peace. And so we're to walk with humility. That's the foundation of our walk. Each, each of the following five characteristics necessitate the previous one. It's almost like they're built upon the previous one. And so the foundation for the other four come from this very one, which is humility. In the Greek and Roman world, humility was not considered to be a virtue. In fact, they didn't have a word for it. They did not have a word for humility because you weren't supposed to do it. So, so the Apostle Paul creates a word by compounding, putting a couple of words together to come up with this idea that we are to walk in a humble way before God. It's, it's the opposite, of course, would be pride. And the reason why that's so important is because pride so often is at, is at the root of so much turmoil. In fact, if... Bible seems to indicate to us that the very first sin was caused as a result of pride. That God had created uh, Lucifer, put him in heaven, we, the highest of the created order, uh, Isaiah 14 and Isaiah 28. Lucifer, the most beautiful created creature, an angel that God had created to put, on, he was created being, but he was the highest of all the angels. And if we understand Isaiah 14 and 28 correctly. He, he wasn't satisfied with that. He wanted to be like God. I want to be God. Pride. I want to be like God. And so he fell and took a third of the angelic force with him. It was pride. Our first uh, parents, Adam and Eve, it was pride that caused them to yield. Remember? Remember? Satan went to them and said, if you will eat of that tree. I know God said you can have everything else, but you, you can't have that. It was a test to determine obedience. <laughs> you know, I don't know why it is. If you tell someone, myself included, don't do it. There seems to be this got to see. Don't touch wet paint. Well, I wonder if it really is. Oh, yeah, it was. 
Don't walk on the grass. Let me just put one foot. I don't, it, it's the sin nature within us now. But Adam and Eve didn't have a sin nature. But the pride grew up within them. We want to be like God. You will be like God if, if you eat. God, God gives us so many blessings and so many good gifts. And so often we go after the one that is the most disastrous. Proverbs, you can read through Proverbs, a lot of challenges. Pride goes before a fall. Pride often is behind pretty much all of the conflicts. I heard, uh, I think this is pretend apocryphal, but somebody who wrote a book, Humility and How I Attained It. You see, humility means that we are Christ sufficient, not self sufficient. Now, don't misunderstand. It doesn't mean that humility means that we dump on ourselves. Oh, we're the worst of the worst, or we're, you know, we're no good. We're no, that's not what humility, we're, we are sons and daughters of God. We are made in the image of God. But in our parenting, we need to be very, very careful. It's easy to say to your child, perhaps, oh, you're the smartest one in your class. You're the greatest athlete. You played the best game. You are the, instead of saying, man, thank you for really trying, you did a great job. There's a, there's a significant difference. You played really well. You put forth great effort. Were they the best? Probably not. But did they try? Yes, they did. And so it isn't, it isn't this what they call the worm theology. I'm no good. God, God is transforming it. Yes, we have our sinners in need of God's grace. We are also image bearers of Almighty God. So the first characteristic is that of humility. The second one, notice, is gentleness, which you have to have humility before you get the gentleness. And the gentleness that is used here, again, Greeks and Romans didn't like this idea, and perhaps some of your ref, uh, Bibles have it translated meekness. But please understand, it is not weakness. The word that is translated meekness here has the idea that you can take a, a wild stallion and you train it. You bring power under control. That's the idea behind this, is that you are, you are being controlled. Actually, the Holy Spirit provides it. That we are being controlled so that we do not respond as we ought not to respond. It is, it is power under control. Just think of the difference we would find on our roads, right? The road rage. What is it? It's not gentleness. You disrespected me. You dissed me, so I'm going to teach you a lesson. The shootings that we see among individuals who have conflicts, the stabbings and the fights that are there. You know what? It kind of reminds me of, you know, if you go for a walk, it's normally the little dogs that are the yappiest. Have you noticed that? They're trying to make a point, I guess. But the idea behind this is power under control, under the control of the Holy Spirit. So humility and gentleness, and then it comes patience. Patience, long-suffering. And it's a word that has the idea to boil, so it takes a long time for you to boil. It's not short-tempered. And it really has to do with the idea of someone who has wronged us. That we don't fly off the handle and respond. Again, these are, these are great truths to teach. First of all, we need to model them in our homes, but then it's also important to teach them to our kids. So we teach them patience when you've been wronged. Next, we show forbearance. There's a little bit of difference between patience and forbearance. But again, they're, they're each built upon the other, I think. Showing forba forbearance means that we put up with others' faults. It's not necessarily that they've wronged us. But you know, they're just a little different. They're different than we are. And so we bear with one another in love. 
when we feel the least like it is when we get to practice patience and forbearance, isn't it? You know, if everything is going well in your life, it's on a Sunday morning, we just listen to the praise team lead us and, you know, things are going well and, and you know, and it's like, oh, this is, it's easy to be patient and forbearing here when, that, when those things are going on. But when you get back sometimes into the family dynamics, immediate or extended, or some coworkers that make your life difficult, that's when we get to see these things, and that's when we get to practice. It's kind of like building up muscle. You don't do it unless you push your muscles to the extreme. And so patience is built up. That James writes it this way. That What is it? The what of your faith? Do you remember James chapter 1? The trying of your faith produces patience. Yeah, that prayer, uh, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now, is not really effective at all. And God says, I will answer your prayer by sending you some difficulty so that you get to exercise patience. Patience and forbearance, and then the last characteristic, number five, preserving the unity of the Spirit. Uh, again, notice what Paul writes. He says, I want, verse 3, I want you to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Being diligent, that means that's going to take some effort. It's going to take some work. Now notice it's an interesting phrase, preserve the unity of the Spirit. Paul doesn't say create the unity of the Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit creates unity among His people. But we don't create it, but we can destroy it. And the word for bond here is the idea of ligaments. That those of you who are medical people or know some medical stuff, you understand that the ligaments hold the bones together. And if you have a problem with one of the ligaments, it doesn't hold as well. A number of years ago, playing basketball, I blew an ACL, anterior cruciate ligament. And uh, I, I didn't know it at the time, and it was, and, and it was playing, as I said, basketball. Fortune, I was thinking, it was like at the, right at the end of the first half, second half, I'm thinking, well, you know, I think, I think I can go back in. And for some reason, you know, got a little more wisdom, saying, you know, maybe I ought to just leave this one alone. And so I got home, and I, I went to take a shower, and I, I pulled my leg up like this, and all of a sudden, my foot shoots off that way, and it's like, ooh, I broke something. Put it back down. It wasn't a whole lot of fun. Got it straightened out. Thought, well, maybe that's a fluke. Pull it up again, same thing. It's like, oh, that's not a fluke. And our girls were young, and they had these little magic wands. Some of you remember they're about yay long and have all kinds of glitter in them. And, and I strapped two of those on either side. and said, you know, I think I need to see a doc. <laughs> it's come to this. And he said, you know, Dan, you, you blew an, a ligament. Now, I didn't create the ligament. God, in his grace and mercy, had designed the body, created it, but I managed to ruin it. And that's the same thing among church family, friends. We, we are here as part of the body of Christ. And so we are called to preserve the bond of unity in the bond of peace. Harmonious church. Harmonious marriage. Harmonious home life. We're going to get our feelings hurt. There are things that are going to make us want to pull back. There are things that are going to make us want to respond differently. And yet the other previous four characteristics help us to preserve the unity of the Spirit. If, if we are practicing the other four, then we are able to do this one. <laughs> Though we have to work diligently at it. You know, I just want to say, I, I really, and I've shared this with, with our church leadership board and some of you, I, I'm just so grateful for the way that, that you as a church family have done that over the past few years. We've had a lot of opportunity for things uh, to destroy the unity, for us to destroy the unity. 
Well, we went through the political system. You know, that season. And then we, you know, Democrat or Republican or Independent or Libertarian or whatever you are. And then we went through the COVID situation. To mask or not to mask, that is the question. We tried to follow the guidelines that we were given to us and make adjustments as necessary. And, and some felt more strongly and some felt less strongly and And yet we understood that to maintain this unity, it isn't about us. It isn't about us. Currently, we are seeing the rise of the racial tensions. And the Bible has much to say about that. There is a biblical background and doctrine to race. As we know, we're all one people. We all come from the long line. We're all related if you go back far enough. And yet, even today, watching tragically some good churches that are being destroyed by racial tension. And so I commend you. Our job is to work hard. Because as Jesus prayed, it's by this, by the love that we have for one another, will all men know that you are disciples. And when it hits the newspapers that this church, whatever name, is blowing up because of these tensions, and there are lawsuits among church members and church leadership, the world says, I don't need that. I don't need that. And so what we hear and what we observe here are not just words on a page, are not just something isolated. It's... It's for us today. So what is it that binds us together? What is it that holds us together? What is the foundation then for our unity? And Paul gives that to us in verses 4 through 6 of what it is that binds us together of chapter 4. And what binds us together is biblical truth. Truth binds us together. And Paul lists for us seven specifics in this section. And I won't take as much time as I have on the first five characteristics, or we may be serving lunch today here as well. First of all, and and by the way, these are grouped. And verse 4 is a group, verse 5 is a group, and verse 6 is not so much a group. But but there is a Trinitarian aspect to each one of these. In in verse 4, we see mention of the Holy Spirit. In verse 5, we see mention of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 6, we see mention of God the Father. It's a reminder that that this is Trinitarian. And, And there are those who are not Trinitarian. And so we don't have a unity with them. So first of all, what's the, what's the first one? Paul says for us in verse 4 that we, there is one body, one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. There's one body. There's only one church. There's only one organic unity. We have differing parts. God has given to us different abilities. But you don't criticize your foot because it can't hear. You don't criticize your eye because it isn't able to do something else. We are one body. Secondly, and in that first group is this one spirit, Holy Spirit, lives in the followers of Christ. When you become a believer, a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes to live within you. There's only one Holy Spirit. We only have one hope. We share one hope, one hope for this world and one hope for the one to come. It's a sure and certain hope. It's based on the promises of God. And so the first, in a sense, it's a triad that's given to us as we we base our unity on the work of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, second group, verse 5, the Lord Jesus Christ, we have one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. The person of Jesus Christ, who is he? First John tells us if anyone denies who Jesus is, they are not a true Christian. So somebody who says, well, you know, it doesn't matter who Jesus is. Let's just love each other and be unified together. We can't. We believe that Jesus is the second person of the Godhead, that he came down into our world, that 
bodily and that he went to the cross physically and that he died physically and that he rose again physically after three days and that he ascended back into heaven, that he lived a perfect life, that he was virgin born. All of those are interconnected. You cannot separate those. And even right now is at the right hand of God the Father with a glorified body interceding for us. There are basics of who Jesus is that we cannot negate, that we cannot separate and say, we're, well, let's just love each other. Well, we can love other people, and I'm not saying that we should be antagonistic to them, but that is, they're not part of the unity that we have. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, secondly, one faith. And I think Paul is referring in his day to Jew and Gentile. We've talked about that previously but today, it, it would be, you know, you maybe you've had conversations with individuals, you know. So what do you believe? I am of the Presbyterian faith. I am of the Lutheran faith. I am of the Methodist faith. I am of the Brethren faith. No. No, no. It's not a label. It's built on biblical truth that we are given. We have a tendency to, today to sort of have this idea that there is no such thing as truth, that, that you can have your truth and, and I can have my truth. It, it's my understanding that Oprah can be credited with that phrase, your truth or my truth, or discredited with that phrase, if you want to maybe be more accurate, that she'll have two individuals, for example, and this is just on her show, and you have a conversation with this person and they say, you know, yeah, I am convinced that two plus two equals four. Well, that's good. That's your truth. And then she'll took, talk to one of her, her other guests there and said, so what do you think? Well, I think two plus two equals seven. Well, that's good. That, that's your truth. No, those are contradictory. There's a truth to be known. And all the others are not just your truth. They're error. They're falsehood. They're wrong. If you want to build a house... And you go to an architect and he designs your house and there's a 20-foot span in there and, and you're wondering, you know, what, what do I need for, for a floor joist? And it's a 20-foot span and so he writes on it, well, we're going to do 16-inch centers, so a 2 by 12 goes at approximately 23 feet, so you'll be fine with, it, with, with, you know, with this 2 by 12. And you go back and say, you know, that, I just went to the lumber yard. Two by 12s are, are, are pretty expensive. I think I'm going to put in a two by four. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't think it'll even hold your subfloor. You're going to be in a basement. Truth matters. You go to an engineer who designs a bridge, you want to make sure that they have run the numbers correctly. You got to get on an airplane. You want to make sure that the pilot has run the numbers correctly, that they are headed in the proper direction. Where are we going today? Oh, it doesn't matter. You can go wherever you want, but, you know, I, I have a... You see, truth matters. And what unites us is the one truth that we find in this book upon which we base our lives. One baptism. There's a little bit of a debate here, and I, I don't know which one it is, okay? So I'm going to be up front. I don't know. Are we talking about water baptism, or are we talking about spirit baptism? Spirit baptism is when you trust Jesus Christ, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Jesus. It's, it, it's what Jesus refers to in John 4, you, as he's having a, excuse me, John 3, as he's having a conversation with Nicodemus. You, you don't know where the wind comes, where it goes, but so is everyone who's born of the Holy Spirit, that there's something that happens to you and me, that there's a change in life that comes as a result of the Holy Spirit. We are baptized into the body of Christ. And we see that physically done in the first few chapters of Acts. We see it happen with the Jews, and then we see it happen with the Gentiles, and we see it happen with the Samaritans, that they were baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. But there's only one of those. Uh, there's an, so what about water baptism? Well, there is one water baptism, and we've had the privilege. Wasn't it really cool to watch some young people commit their lives, tell their story of what God has done in their life and through them, and as a result, as they seek to become followers of Jesus? We have a few more on the horizon, we think. And if you haven't been baptized, I urge, as Paul says, I urge you and I implore you, 
to follow Jesus in baptism. So water baptism, there's one, you know, and so as a result of that then, is it spirit or water? I don't know, but there's only one, either one of those. And that's what binds us together. And then the last thing that Paul says that binds us together, the seventh one is that we, we are united with God the Father, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now that's not a pantheistic statement that God's in the trees and the rocks and whatever. It's God controls his universe. There's no place that you and I can go that is outside of God's keeping. That there are pagan cultures that claim to be God, but they're not God. And so I challenge us this morning as followers of Christ that we are called to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. That as we interact together, we walk in a manner worthy of our calling. That as we go out, and maybe some of you to a restaurant or to family gatherings, even on this uh, Memorial Day, that we walk in a manner worthy of our calling, that it balances out as we go home to live our lives within our marriages and within our families, that we live in a manner that's worthy of our calling, that as we interact with our children and our children interact with us as children interact with parents, that, that there's a walk in a manner worthy of our calling. That as we go out and get into the business world, that we walk in a manner according to our calling. And what binds us together, dear friends, is the person of Jesus Christ and all of the truths. It's a new commandment, Jesus said, I give to you that you love one another. And maybe if you're not a follower of Jesus today yet, you can't say, well, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. Perhaps you don't know or you're not sure. I'd be delighted, or maybe you came with someone and they'd love to sit down with you and say, let me, let me tell you about who Jesus is and what he's done for me and how you can know him personally. This is a personal relationship. And the people around us just so desperately need to see Christ at work, don't they? Christ at work in our lives. Christ at work in, our, in his church. Christ at work in our business. That we walk as followers of Christ in a manner worthy of our calling. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you did call us. It's a privilege that you've granted to us. And so as a result of that, we go from principle to practice in this section as we want to walk worthy of what you've done as we think in terms of the fact that you called us to be part of your family. We didn't deserve it. We don't earn it. There's nothing in us that, draw, that drew us to you. It was just your mercy, your grace, and your love. And so we're called to walk in a manner worthy of what you've done for us. And as we reflect on that even more, we realize what a privilege we have. Lord, I thank you for this local church that seeks to live out the unity that you've given to us through the person of Christ. Lord, that we might be an example to those within our community, that we might be an example to those within our lives, within our spheres of influence. Lord, that we walk in a manner worthy of what you've done for us, worthy of being, not that we make ourselves your children, but you've called us to be your children. So Lord, thank you again for each one here, the lives that they live, the families. I pray, God, that we be challenged to live out the reality of Christ it's in his name we pray. Amen.